everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our podcast, No Stupid Questions. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences, or CNIS, at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Villan, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama. And we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. So today's conversation is going to take us into an area that we haven't yet talked about on our podcast. And it's one that is really important and relevant right now. So we've talked about athletes, and while I love sports, I'm not an athlete. (laughs) And we've talked about healthcare provider training, and well, I'm not that kind of doctor. (laughs) But our guest this week, she studies things um, that we use every single day, like you and I actually use. Um, If you've ever used something, or should we say someone, like Siri or Alexa, um, as you're trying to find your favorite podcast or Netflix show, today's conversation is for you. And who knew there could be research related to Siri or Alexa? (laughs) And I'm half waiting right now for Siri or Alexa to pipe up and tell me they didn't understand. Could I try again? (laughs) And these helpers have some negative, not just like the frustrating Siri, next track, Siri, next track, Siri, next track, outcomes that our guest is going to talk about today. So our next guest is an associate professor in the School of Library and Information Studies. And you might think, library? Okay, so she works in a library and she helps me check out books. This is so not the case. Dr. Miriam Sweeney studies anthropomorphic design. And if you're like me and are thinking, I have no idea what that means, yep. we're going to dive into it in this conversation. Miriam studies the relationship between identity and design and artificial intelligence voice assistance. That's a mouthful. <laughs> and we're going to yep. break it all down. Um, And I'm not going to lie, after having this conversation with Miriam, I felt a lot smarter. We used a lot of big words, or at least she did. When I first got my iPhone and I was setting up things like Siri, I know that I tried out the British male voice and the Australian female voice, but I never really thought too much about how those seemingly small decisions might affect me. So please stick around for our conversation with Dr. Miriam Sweeney as we learn so much more about virtual assistants and uh, voice interfaces through the lenses of gender, race, and sexuality. Welcome, Miriam. question is, um, I noticed that you do some work related to emojis and that it was recently uh, world, that's not even national, but world emoji day. Um, So we we will talk about your research um, about race and emojis, but uh, what is the last emoji that you used? Oh, wow. You know, I have to say, and I don't really want to even contextualize it, but like the spooky... (laughs) The spooky ghost emoji has really gotten a lot of play in the last few weeks on my phone. So, yeah. (laughs) I'm going to have to track that one down. I think I'm going to like that. It's good. It kind of sticks out its tongue. So it's like spooky, but silly. But I don't know. There's a lot of function for that. So, yeah. (laughs) For sure. All right. So let's jump into this. Um, If you could give us an elevator pitch on your research, that would be great. Sure. Well, as you all mentioned, um, I consider myself a critical digital media scholar. And so that kind of lives in an interdisciplinary space where um, I consider my home to be with the internet studies folks and also the media folks. There's a lot of overlap in there. And as you say, I'm interested in issues of particularly race and gender and sexuality um, and how ideologies about those power structures shape the design use and meaning of technology. So I particularly look at things like virtual assistants. So that would be things like um, the Amazon Alexa or Apple Siri. So all these virtual assistants that we're probably used to, you know, in daily life. Um, And then also other technologies that are similar to those that use anthropomorphic design. So computer programs that are designed to look or interact with you like a human does. And I'm really interested in the design of those technologies as humans and what we can you know, kind of glean from how they're particularly designed to tell us things about gender, race, and sexuality. 
So that just sounds incredibly fascinating, and I cannot wait for your answer on this. If you had to come up with a headline for one of your more interesting findings, what would that be? Okay, sure. So um, virtual assistant design can tell us a lot about our cultural attitudes about race and gender. Um, Maybe a sexier one is virtual assistant design can be quite racist and sexist, (laughs) Um, but it doesn't have to be, right? Um, But yeah, that's probably a finding that I I come to a lot. Um, Often these technologies are you know, designed as, as uh, women, as female sort of uh, presenting technologies. And that's been, you know, people ask that question a lot, like, hey, why are these all women, you know? Um, and the answers to that have to do a lot with our cultural expectations about, you know, who performs different kinds of service roles and service labor. So yeah, it's a, it's a really like, it, it, interface design seems like, oh, you know, what, how deep can that really go, but actually quite deep in terms of our cultural identity. So how did you get started doing this type of research? Great question. Um, when I was a master's student, a long time ago now, <laughs> um, <laughs> back in the days. We're not telling. Yes, yeah, right. No, we, we weren't telling. <laughs> um, I, I remember when, I don't know if you all remember the Ms. Dewey search engine. Does that sound familiar to either of you? Um, um, no. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Circa 2006. <laughs> um, that was the time of like a lot of these like viral marketing campaigns. There was like the Burger King chicken guy, um, and who did like these viral videos. Um, and at that same time, Microsoft kind of got in on that and they were debuting what is now their Bing search engine. Um, but at the time to kind of make it sexy and get some, you know, some, some cultural traction, they actually gave it kind of a sleek interface with a sexy virtual assistant called Ms. Dewey. Mm. And it was actually the actress Janina Gavinkar who is on a lot of like sci-fi shows. She was on the L word. She's been around, um, you know, sort of the, the sci-fi uh, loop. But at that time she was the face of Ms. Dewey and they recorded her, you know, doing all these different little sketches. And then the search engine interface had her when you would type in a search word like she would interact with it depending on what you typed. So it was kind of like this interactive search interface. And I remember seeing that and I was like, what is this? (laughs) Um, (laughs) And just that question became what I wrote my dissertation about. So I focused on the design of that interface and that kind of led me down a rabbit hole um, to learn about all the past interfaces, you know, even things like Microsoft's Clippy um, mm-hmm. you know, is considered like, mm-hmm. like the chat bots and things like that. And then now, of course, you know, virtual assistants are all around us, you know, they're integrated into everything, maybe not embodied, but you know, how many of us are talking to Siri or Alexa or something else mm-hmm. all the time. So I, I remember, um, what is the, the, um, navigation, early navigation, I guess, um, where you could pick your your voice um, who was talking to you. Oh, yeah. Sure. So, like on Siri? Well, oh, I, I don't use Siri because okay. I'm not that fancy. But yeah. <laughs> basically, so, where you, yeah, I always picked a British. Uh-huh. Yeah, where you pick like a, a guy or a girl or a, a, some sort of accent that you found helpful I uh-huh. guess so do you do you look at not only um I guess what the options are and what that says but also who is picking what yeah good questions um yes I also like to default to a British male voice as well I don't know that feels soothing to me <laughs> it's fine I mean, there's probably like a psychology you know analysis of that. Um, but yeah, so I do look though at, um, at the way the interface prioritizes particular options, um, through like sort of default voices. So even Mm -hmm. though like a lot of these, uh, systems now do have, there's sort of an increasing, you know, amount of customization that you can do with, with picking different voices. Um, you know, historically that's been less true, but, but also who gets to be the default, right? And so Mm -hmm. even when there's more options like that, like when you get your Jeeves option, right? There's usually, (laughs) uh, usually the woman option is the first choice. It's the default Mm -hmm. setting. So you have to opt out of that, right? To get to Mm -hmm. a different option. So that's the kind of, so I I really focus in my work more around sort of the design aspects of it. But your question about like who is picking what is also very interesting 
um, and probably demands its own study. Yeah, for sure. So I'm so curious to learn more about how you actually study what you study, the methodologies that you employ. Um, can you shed a little bit of light on on that whole process? Sure. Um, you know, the smart ass in me is like, very carefully is how I study it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't resist. I'm so sorry. Um, but the real answer is more like, I do, you know, for internet studies folks, I think that there's always like, you know, you're always kind of like forging new trails when you're looking into emerging technologies, because there's not always like a blueprint and how to study some of these technologies. Often like we're dealing with systems that are proprietary. Um, so that means I don't always, you know, get to sort of look behind the hood in an approved kind of way. So mm -hmm. I use a lot of different methods to kind of like, you know, bricolage approach it. And um, part of that is like interface analysis. So I look at, um, you know, the design of the interface. Like I just said, like what is default, you know, who, um, for the search engine, I looked at things like, you know, what search terms were correlated to which kinds of actions, you know, that kind of thing, to kind of look sort of technically at, at that. And if I can, to look at encoding. So for the Emoji project, um, I did also look at like Unicode itself to look at, you know, the encoding mechanisms. Um, and then I pair that with often other approaches to answer kind of different aspects of questions. So things like critical discourse analysis, um, which you can also do with interface design, but also um, I, I tend to look at user forums and, you know, how did people experience and, and talk about things like Ms. Dewey or emojis, right? Like just, mm -hmm. um, just on blogs and forums where people offer many different thoughts that, you know, no one solicited, but there it is. <laughs> and <laughs> that's really interesting and rich because it's sort of like unprompted. People have a lot of interpretations of these technologies and, um, I can sort of overlay some of these methods, you know, historical methods as well, um, to come up with, you know, kind of a picture that is really based in, for, for my stuff, is really based in kind of cultural studies methods. But, you know, it uses a lot of different parts to answer different parts of those questions. Mm -hmm. So do you work, um, is most of your work done solo or do you have collaborators that you work with? Yeah, great. I love this question. I really love working with collaborators and um, it's always, I mean, you know, working with a new collaborator is just like having a new relationship. Like they're all different um, in different ways, <laughs> some positive and some, some not, but I have so many wonderful positive, you know, collaborations. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's fun for me to work with people because I find research can be kind of like lonely doing it alone, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. putting brains together and having people, you know, having someone else who's in it with you to kind of really push you and talk out ideas, I think is super valuable and just fun. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that that's interesting. Um, even with my students who are writing their research papers right now. Um, they're, they're like, I did this all by myself. I'm like, yes. And that's amazing. Right. But you don't have to. In the you don't have to, you though. To, you, you get to work with other people and it doesn't have to be because they they comment on that. Am I doing this right? I mm -hmm. wish I had someone to bounce ideas off of. And mm -hmm. yeah, totally. And like, and again, and like the, you know, the best kind of pairings make you better, you know, and and um, having someone else to sort of be accountable to in that space and that thinking space, like I really like. I find that my work sometimes will go in directions that I definitely never would have maybe pushed for if it was just me. And that mm -hmm. opens up new areas mm -hmm. of exploration. Yeah. So to follow up on that, when you are collaborating with others, are they colleagues in your discipline? Are they colleagues in other disciplines? Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I both is definitely the answer to that. And also because I find like media studies, um, information science, like they, these are already super interdisciplinary disciplines. So even mm -hmm. folks who are kind of like adjacent to you in that, in, a, in that disciplinary space may really be using different, you know, tools and literatures um, as well. So I, I think that it's sort of both for me, like I, it's multidisciplinary in the sense that like I definitely, um, there's rich collaborations that I've had. I have a, a collaboration currently with my colleague um, at the University of Rhode Island, Dr. Melissa Nicholas. So shout out to her work. 
but she does mm -hmm. um, Latinx information history. And mm. I study, you know, virtual assistant design. And so we have kind of put our heads together to look at virtual assistant design as Latinx workers. <laughs> and oh. it was a really interesting pairing where we each had, you know, some different domain knowledge. And then together it went so much farther, you know, because of that. So, um, so it's kind of a, a multidisciplinary uh, kind of example, even though, I mean, I'd say we're both doing critical digital media studies, we have different knowledge domains. Um, but then like from sort of an interdisciplinary standpoint, I, I think, you know, trying to always find literatures that could be helpful that, you know, you might not have initially been exposed to in your own discipline is always a way to refresh and like reorient, you know, problem solving. Um, so I, I enjoy that as well. So one of the things that you have um, mentioned a couple of times is uh, critical approaches mm -hmm. to research. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the questions that we have is how does your research contribute to social justice? Yes, um, an important question, especially sort of in this political moment, right, where right. we have mm -hmm. so many, mm -hmm. um, obviously, so many pressing social issues have come boiled to the fore here. Um, yeah, I feel like questions I study in my research often have to do with um, technology as an extension of power structures and power systems. So if we're, we're asking questions about things like um, whiteness or, um, or how, you know, how, does, how do ideas about race um, manifest themselves or shape technology design, those kinds mm -hmm. of questions are often sort of central to what I'm exploring uh, because technology is often thought, like I think we take for granted like the technologies that we use, like, oh, they're just there. Like that's just your computer. What would that have right. to do with race, right? Or what would that have mm -hmm. to do with gender? Mm -hmm. But, you know, actually these technologies are completely, like they do, you know, embody and also reinforce different kinds of power arrangements. So, mm -hmm. um, so I guess the answer to this question is, I'm not sure that I, you know, classify this work as like, this is like diversity work, but it is, this is mm -hmm. work that is engaged in making like visible power structures in our technologies that are often taken for granted with the idea that we would want to intervene on that to make a better world. Yeah. You know, we would want to change, like if our technology has been identified as, um, you know, as sexist or as reinforcing, you know, racial inequity, then that, of course, we have to be able to really clearly identify that before we can intervene on it and shift it. Yeah, for sure. Well, this is a really naive statement, but I'm not sure that, you know, so many of us who are just on the computers interacting with virtual assistants and all that sort of thing would even think about all the things that you just said about power structure and how it all ties in together so it it really is is so fascinating but such important work it's just so cool to hear all the stuff that you do well thanks and i mean this is why we definitely have to talk across disciplines you know and kind of mm -hmm. include each other in the conversations because i do think we're all asking different questions about similar technologies Mm -hmm. And that like having the literacy kind of back and forth it can only strengthen, you know, that like it's not enough for just particular domain silos to care about, you know, questions mm -hmm. of like technology and inequity. Um, so we definitely need to be working across STEM and, you know, other kinds of fields to open that up as like another way to understand expertise in those areas. Certainly. Yeah. So if you, you've been studying this for several years yeah um and <laughs> several yeah <laughs> technology has changed so much yeah um where 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 do you think it's going and do you think that that your work um is is doing that intervention um and and have you seen kind of a, a change to to have more thoughtful technology Oh, you know, for sure. It's interesting when I, I feel like when I started this kind of line of inquiry as a graduate student, then my job was to convince people that we should care about virtual assistants because they weren't totally, you know, integrated into everything. <laughs> and now yeah. that is not a challenge. Now it's like, you know, <laughs> homes are being built with Alexa integration. Like you can't buy appliances mm -hmm. that don't also, you know, connect to internet of things, right? That this is all more and more mainstream. 
so the challenge now is not to convince people that it matters, but um, but I do think that there is, you know, as these become more ubiquitous, and also as we find ourselves in a moment where I think there's actually a lot of public scrutiny around technology and emerging technology right now. You know, a lot of pushback mm -hmm. on like facial recognition technologies. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and ideas about like algorithmic bias, you know, like this, these are becoming more public, you know, conversations that are happening. And also with like Facebook and the 2016 election, there's a lot of yeah. calls for like accountability yep. in tech and all of this stuff. And so I think that that's great. And also kind of an entryway into sort of the next phase of this research where I'm starting to see that folks are coming up with different kinds of interventions and those in of themselves are really interesting to start exploring. So um, there's like a project called Q, the um, genderless virtual assistant. Um, oh. And it's, you know, it's kind of put together as um, a concept by different nonprofit groups um, and also like technologists who are like, hey, how do we design, you know, like kind of a gender neutral virtual assistant and they're looking at like, okay, what if we sort of took, you know, different um, like voice spectrums and kind of remix them to find like a true neutral and, you know, train that data off of um, non-binary and trans identified people and, you know, and work on that project. And so like, that's very interesting. And so now I'm like, okay, let's now let's study some of these interventions and think about what they can tell us about the current moment and where we're at, you know? Yeah. So shifting gears just a little bit, we've been working from home for four and a half months ish around that. So can you tell us about um, the pandemic, how it's affected your research, if it has affected it at all, maybe some of the challenges you've encountered and any bright spots there might be? Sure. Um, yeah. Wow. I mean, beyond the sort of soft pants. <laughs> you know, <laughs> lifestyle that I've embraced. <laughs> I mean, I'm never going back to wearing... I hope that's a bright spot. That's a bright I'm spot. I'm never going back, spot. right? Category. For sure. Like, I think this has shown us that we actually don't need to wear pants, so we're good. Um, so that's a bright spot. But uh, truly, like, on a more serious note, like, yeah, it's been really challenging. I think that for a lot of folks who struggle with things like anxiety and depression and other kind of mental health things, and I put myself in that category it's been really hard to focus on research. You know, that there's so much happening out there right now. So many, you know, 2020 has brought us just, you know, issue after issue of the pandemic. We have social unrest, you know, we have all sorts of things happening and unfolding and election pending. It's a lot, you know, and I have definitely felt when I'm sitting down to try to focus on research that, you know, there's a lot of really big picture things that are occupying my mind right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that my research is connected to, to you know, to the real world, but yeah, the, it's been hard to prioritize some of that, right? Um, and I think too that I've noticed in some academic circles, like things have not slowed down, you know? Um, yeah. Like I remember there was like a time like, w you know, when the protests were really starting and unfolding and hitting hard, um, you know, it's like calls for papers or like going through my inbox. And I'm just like, you guys, like, we just need a, a minute, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that, like, that stuff for me has been the biggest challenge. And, like, research is labor. Like, it's work. And we've we've had a <laughs> lot of disruptions in, in work. And I think we're seeing a lot of the fragility of the structures that, you know, govern our academic lives right now. Mm -hmm. But maybe a bright spot is that we can use that as an opportunity to rethink work structures and academic work mm -hmm. practices and expectations and maybe build more empathy for each other, you know, across across the hierarchies of academia as well. I'm, I like that. I like that. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. So um, wrapping up, um, we'll, we'll end on another hopefully a little a, a fun question here. So okay. as, as academics, we have had the good fortune of being able to travel to different countries and different cities around the U.S. for conferences um, and sharing our research. What are some of the favorite places that you have visited to share research um, or that you're looking forward to visiting in the future? 
That's a fun question. Yeah. Especially at a time when I'm definitely full of travel dreams, you know, like what would it be like to leave my house is a question that I have daily. (laughs) Um, I have to say that, you know, Barcelona is right up there for favorite cities to visit um, for conferences and also maybe Berlin. Like I've been to a few in Berlin and um, Mm -hmm. just like an intriguing place. Um, I had a conference lined up for the fall that will not be happening for the Association of Internet Researchers. They're going to move it online like so many have done, but that was going to be in Dublin. And I have been, to, oh, yeah, wow. I've been to Dublin before. And I'll tell you that, like, I didn't think I was going to love Dublin as much as I did, but there was quite a bit to love about the spirit of Dublin. So mm-hmm. um, in October, I'll be there in my mind as I log right. on <laughs> to the virtual <laughs> conference. <laughs> Miriam, it has been so great talking with you today. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you mu- so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Miriam. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for joining us today in our conversation with Dr. Miriam Sweeney. I have to be honest, I learned so much over the course of this conversation, and I learned more about how the technology I use every single day can be affecting me and affecting others who use it. So I hope you enjoyed it. It was a great conversation. Next week, we're going to be talking about teaching in an online environment and all of the challenges associated with that. We have all pivoted to remote learning and virtual learning and it's a challenging thing so our next two guests are going to help us navigate that whole platform so hope to see you next week thanks so much for listening